It's a prospect so chilling that it needs a term of its own. Weapons of mass destruction. From nuclear warheads that can reduce a city to dust in the blink of an eye, to lethal chemicals that can sweep through a landscape and kill everything in their path, to dirty bombs that will inflict decades of pain on the victims of their fallout, WMDs are the worst of the worst. They're inventions that intend not just to harm a targeted enemy, not just to attack a military force, but to kill at a massive scale with no regard for the innocents that may lie in their path. But there's one category of WMDs that are perhaps worst of all, biological weapons. A nuclear blast might be devastating, the deployment of a chemical weapon may kill hundreds or even thousands in devastating fashion, but at least they can be contained, and at least they won't last long. Bioweapons, though, it's another matter entirely. From parasites to superbugs to genetically engineered viruses, biological warfare is all about creating or harnessing the most devastating sources of illness that nature can offer and then letting nature do its work in a chain reaction that before too long becomes impossible for even its creator to control. In today's installment of our Art of War series, we're gonna be digging into the use of biological weapons, how they're made, how they're deployed, their most infamous appearances throughout history, and why humanity's next instance of biological warfare might be the worst we've ever seen. When you think about the term biological warfare, it probably conjures up one of a few specific images. Perhaps you picture medieval warfare with the corpses of humans and animals being flung over the walls of a castle to spread disease among those inside. Perhaps you picture people in white laboratory coats and goggles tuning a superbug to wipe out half the planet. Or perhaps you picture the fallout of the mass infection of the population, cities grinding to a halt and ordinary people forced to accept their own deaths by infection or illness. And whatever you imagine, you've probably hit the nail on the head because while biological warfare is a field with a whole lot of complexity, its scope is actually pretty broad. According to the World Health Organization, biological weapons are either microorganisms like viruses, bacteria, or fungi, or toxic substances produced by living organisms that are produced and released deliberately to cause disease and death in humans, animals, or plants. Put simply, biological warfare is the use of living matter to cause illness in other living matter, either with or without the intention of killing the target. So, for example, seeding an enemy's water supply with the eggs of a parasite is biological warfare. Pulling toxins from the skin of a frog and putting it on a blow dart is biological warfare. Releasing swarms of locusts on an enemy's crop field, biological warfare. Technically, even feeding an enemy soldier a plate of poisonous mushrooms is biological warfare. And yes, engineering a planet-killing super plague is also biological warfare. I guess that's directed to all the super villain biochemists in our audience. You know, just know you've got options. Among the weapons at one's disposal in biological warfare, there is no tool more reliable than the humble bacterium. Not all bacteria are useful as bioweapons. A plague of Lactobacillus acidophilus, for example, would just be a plague where everyone digests their food very efficiently. But bacteria have also been responsible for many of the most deadly diseases in history, both used as a weapon and spreading as the indirect result of warfare. Take for example Yersinia pestis, better known as the Black Death, which killed some 30 to 50 percent of people in 14th century Europe alone and wiped out as many as 200 million people globally during its worst outbreak. Or take Vibrio cholerae, better known as just cholera, which even today causes up to 140,000 deaths per year or more around the world. Dysentery too is a remarkably lethal and wide-ranging condition caused by bacterial infection, still killing around 1.1 million people every year, mostly in developing countries countries. And finally, you might have heard of Bacillus anthracis, or its common name, anthrax, which can be fatal in up to 90% of infection cases and has become a well-known weapon for bioterrorists around the world. They're really good at self-replicating, they're very easy to grow in laboratory conditions, and although most of them can be killed off by antibiotics, those that can become antibiotic resistant can be a major, major problem. More on that shortly. And then there's the virus, a structure that isn't living per se, but is capable of self-replication when inside a living cell. For a quick casual indicator of just how deadly viruses can be, we'll start by name-dropping a rather major one, smallpox, which before its total eradication in 1977 is believed to have killed up to 500 million people across the world in the 20th century alone. Influenza, despite the fact that it's not exactly viewed as the boogeyman that it should be, is still responsible for the deaths of nearly half a million people annually. While major pandemics have taken the 
lives of tens of millions in one fell swoop. HIV is a virus, rabies is a virus, dengue fever is a virus, Ebola virus, if you couldn't tell, also a virus. As biological weapons, they're a good deal harder to grow than bacteria, but they're much harder to cure. And there are no easy countermeasures to take against every virus, like an antibiotic, which stands a chance at helping against every bacterium. Then there are parasites. Some of them are well known in the modern world. Malaria, for example, is a parasite spread primarily by infected mosquitoes, and it's believed to be responsible for somewhere between 150 and 300 million deaths in the 20th century. The parasitic worm, Schistosomiasis, claims the lives of 200,000 people each year in the modern day and is considered endemic in countries where nearly a billion people live. Other parasites are far less lethal, but are a nuisance or can even be debilitating, and many are easily spread through water if it's not properly treated. They're quite difficult to modify in a laboratory, but what they lose in terms of customizability, they typically make back by just being incredibly nasty to deal with or even think about, which also gives them a psychological value when used as a weapon. Aside from those three major categories, bioweapons can come in the form of fungi, venom, and toxins that can be extracted from animals, and prions, which can cause brain diseases in mammals that are completely untreatable and are always fatal. So too can insects be a bioweapon, both as vectors of disease and as attackers against crops, as in the case of locusts, or humans as in the case of murder hornets. And it's here that the first major distinction of biological weapons in warfare starts to become clear. Unlike, say, uranium, which has to be in rich, popped inside a bomb and detonated before it can be used as a WMD, or chlorine gas, which has to be collected or manufactured and put into a delivery device before it can kill you, deadly biological agents are out there, killing people en masse, regardless of whether they're being delivered intentionally by humans. Those that aren't killing people, whether they're eradicated like smallpox or mostly dormant like anthrax, would certainly like to be killing people if they got the chance, meaning that in the case of biological warfare, the use of bioweapons is more about putting viruses bacteria or whatever else into situations where they can start infecting a target population. From there, nature will just run its course, regardless of whether a bioweapons creators work to usher it along or not. And nature will run its course on occasion, even after the nation that deploys a bioweapon reaches peace with their former enemy, or even after their bioweapon turns on their own people. As for why bioweapons are used, they can be deployed for a wide variety of reasons. On a grand scale, pathogens can be deployed with the goal of wiping out large portions of an enemy force without involving one's own troops in direct combat. Both ancient and modern sieges deserve a particular mention here, with one side barricaded and functionally trapped into whatever fortress they've chosen and able to fight back against infectious diseases or other biological agents with only the supplies or medicine they have on hand. Bioweapons can also be deployed against a civilian population, and often are, either as part of a scorched earth offensive meant to cripple an enemy's means to fight back, or in campaigns of genocide or extermination against a population that is itself seen as the intended target. Bioweapons are potentially an invaluable tool in political assassinations. After all, they're practically untraceable and often won't even register as an assassination in the first place. They can be used as an instrument to instill fear or even to incapacitate people without killing them. If you don't believe me, just try defending the nearest castle while you've got sleeping sickness. But if that's how bioweapons can be deployed, then who's cultivating them and who's preparing to use them? Often the culprit is a nation state. Although the manufacture and deployment of offensive biological warfare is a war crime and generally seen as being, well, pretty bad on the war crime spectrum. The practice of defensive biological research, though, that's very much allowed. That means that a nation state might develop cures and treatments in order to respond to various potential bioweapons, but it also means that those same nation states will typically have to cultivate those same viruses, those same bacteria, and those same fungi in order to study them. Many countries around the world are known or believed to keep strains of some pretty serious diseases, and two, the United States and Russia, are still known to have designated stockpiles of the smallpox virus, which is otherwise thought to have been completely eradicated in the natural world. Beyond just defensive biological research, nation states are also at liberty to decide that they don't care about war crimes and just manufacture bioweapons anyway. Nations from Russia to North Korea to the US and the UK and many more are suspected or accused of either actively cultivating biological weapons or otherwise having breakout capability. That is to say, the materials and knowledge necessary to produce a biological weapon if they chose to do so. This hasn't stopped nearly every nation on Earth from having signed and made themselves party to the Biological Weapons Convention, but of course there's no telling what those same nations will do behind closed doors. As for the eight nations that still haven't signed the treaty, Chad, Comoros, Djibouti, 
Eritrea, Israel, Kiribati, Micronesia, and Tuvalu, oh well, you're all sus. And speaking of people who are sus, we've also got to emphasize that in the modern day, bioweapons can be used by a wide range of non-state actors. Not all bioweapons are the same, and not all bioweapons are necessarily that hard to get your hands on. Sure, developing a custom-made super virus is going to take more resources than the average amateur biologist is going to have in their garage, but the same can't be said for other biological agents. According to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, and yes, that's the same group of people that has the terrifying doomsday clock, it may be possible for some bioweapons to be manufactured by people with only very limited skills or equipment. That includes, for example, terrorists who might see the cultivation of anthrax spores as being more efficient and a potentially destructive use of their time than trying to duplicate a 9-11 style attack. It also includes disgruntled scientists, people who like the idea of killing other people and even stupid teenagers with an internet connection. Indeed, the intentional spreading of disease has been a tool of non-state actors in isolated incidents throughout history, and it's a remarkably effective one at that. Finally, biological weapons can be used as elements of a nation or non-state actors' defense in much the same way that nuclear weapons or even conventional weapons can as deterrence. Just like how a country probably isn't going to attack their neighbor if their neighbor's military is 10 times larger, anybody who holds a serious stockpile of biological weapons, and with it the ability to unleash plagues upon those who pose a threat to their survival, probably isn't about to be messed with unless it's absolutely necessary. As we've seen with nations that try to acquire chemical or nuclear weapons, a nation's attempt to come into possession of a bioweapon might be cause for war. But as soon as said nation actually gets the bioweapon thereafter, they've gained an exceptionally potent deterrent that should keep any potential enemy at bay. Luckily for troops on the ground, there's one place biological warfare isn't likely to see any use. Tactical engagements, battles, skirmishes, and any other confrontations that are going to be decided in a matter of minutes or hours rather than days. At a minimum, the vast majority of bioweapons will require an incubation period inside the human body of at least a couple of days before a person becomes symptomatic or before they're able to infect other people around them. Not only that, but whenever a force with biological weapons is close enough to see and fight each other directly, they're also close enough that if they were to release aerosolized bioweapons, they'd risk being infected themselves. For a method of warfare that seems to require such a clear view of germ theory, the science of disease transmission, and more, it might come as a bit of a surprise that biological warfare has been practiced for as long as the historical record has been maintained. While ancient cultures may not have been quite right about why diseases spread or how they work, they were more than aware of one basic principle. When you put sick people, dead people, dead animals, rotting materials, sewage, or other such things around healthy people, those healthy people don't tend to stay healthy for very long at all. Take, for example, the so-called Hittite Plague, which washed over the Middle East around the end of the 14th century BCE. Yes, this is a documented instance of biological warfare nearly 3,500 years ago. The Hittite Plague was brought on by a conflict between the Hittites, living in and around the modern-day Levant, in places we call Israel, Lebanon, and Turkey, and the ancient Egyptians, who controlled not just parts of modern-day Egypt, but a good portion of the Middle East and North Africa. In the year 1325 BCE, Hittite raids along the Egyptian border brought a passenger back home. A bacteria called Francisella tularensis, which caused a serious illness today known as rabbit fever, and it'll kill about 40 to 60 percent of infected people if it's not cured. In later wars by the Hittites, some researchers speculate that rabbit fever was instrumental in helping them find victory over the Azawa people of modern northern Turkey, and documents of Hittite rituals suggest that a ram, likely a carrier of tularemia, was sent with an attendant to ward Azawans, spreading disease and event the Azawan side documented too. More likely than not, this effort would have actually involved a whole lot more than just one ram. And not for nothing, the Hittites made a good choice in biological agents even in the 20th century. Tularemia was stockpiled by both the US and the Soviets as a potential bioweapon. Just about a millennium later, the Roman Empire started picking up its own experience in biological warfare. The malaria-infested Pondine marshes served as a natural barrier for the Romans, guarding against invasion, and although the Romans didn't quite understand why armies would fall ill while passing through the marshes, they understood that the pestilence of the region was enough to punish any enemy who attempted to pass by. They found themselves on the receiving end of biological warfare in the 2nd century BCE, when the Carthaginian commander used venomous snakes in a naval battle to break the will of a Roman fleet. Loading the snakes into clay pots, Hannibal's forces launched them at the ship where the Roman king of the time was commanding his navy, breaking the king's will and ending the battle decisively. 
The Parthians would replicate the tactics centuries later, launching scorpion bombs at the forces of Roman Emperor Septimus Severus. But the Romans got their own licks in, launching beehives for the same purposes. Roman forces also took to dipping their swords in feces or into dead bodies, yes, rather nasty we know, to ensure that those enemies who weren't slain by their blade were later slain by tetanus. Fast forward to the mid-1300s, and we come to the golden hordes of the Mongol Empire. We mentioned earlier the sheer magnitude and death toll of the bubonic plague in Europe around this time, killing at least some 25 million people just on the continent. To hear a fair proportion of experts tell it, it was the Mongols who were patient zero for that epidemic. When the Mongols attacked the ancient city of Kaffa and what is now modern-day Crimea, they spent three years tied up in a siege, during which time the defending side was ravaged by plague. But eventually, they decided to use that plague to their advantage, using catapults to launch the corpses of those who had died from the disease out at the Mongol force outside. The disease spread to great effect, and Mongol warriors who eventually departed from the siege, messengers, supply convoys, and other mobile groups may well have spread the disease to the surrounding parts of Mongol territory, setting up more and more opportunities to transmit disease everywhere the Golden Horde went. In the New World, one of the first uses of biological warfare came during the 1760s when a British force besieged inside Fort Pitt during the French and Indian War decided to turn smallpox to their advantage. During negotiations with a delegation from the native Lenape tribe, the Lenape were presented with blankets that had been taken from the fort's infirmary where they were believed to be infested with smallpox. Unfortunately for the British, the strategy didn't seem to work, and the same negotiators would show up later, remarkably devoid of smallpox. But the tactic was replicated elsewhere, and smallpox took a massive toll on the native North American population, regardless of whether it was spread as a bioweapon or transmitted naturally. The British would then catch the bad end of biological warfare tactics in their wars against Napoleon, who leveraged malaria against nearly 40,000 British troops on the island of Walcheren. Within the span of a couple of months, British forces on the island were so badly brutalized that they had to end their campaign, with only some 4,000 troops still in fighting shape by the end. Modern biological warfare kicked off in the same conflict that modern chemical warfare did, World War I, where although all sides seemed to agree that chemical weapons were better than biological ones against humans, bioweapons were instrumental in sabotage operations. A young American doctor named Anton Dilger had been turned by German intelligence following his early work at a German field hospital, and in 1915 he took a mission to head home to America armed with both anthrax and the bacterium Burkholderia mali, which causes a disease called glanders. Dilger's target wasn't American humans, but America's horses and mules, and the campaign was a resounding success. In the following few months, thousands of animals would be killed, and Dilger would eventually be awarded an Iron Cross by Germany for his work. Oddly enough, Dilger would die in the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic shortly afterward, while his tactics would be replicated by France to spread glanders across the horse population of the Central Powers. Also in World War I, Germany would be accused of spreading cholera in Italy and the plague in Russia, although an investigation by the League of Nations in 1924 would be unable to substantiate those claims. In World War II, it was common for powerful militaries on either side of the conflict to conduct research and development on biological weapons weapons, but none even came close to the sinister work of Imperial Japan, and specifically Unit 731. Under the leadership of microbiologist Shiro Ishii, and then the physician and Lieutenant General Masaji Katano, Unit 731 conducted some of the most sickening war crimes across all of World War II. Plague-infected fleas bred by the unit were sprayed from low-flying airplanes during the Japanese wars against mainland China, killing tens of thousands of people via the bubonic plague alone, and paratyphoid fever spread into wells and marshes and distributed in snacks given to Chinese locals took an even more devastating toll. During World War II, Japan would launch attacks using anthrax, typhoid, cholera, and more, with a combined death toll of some 400,000 Chinese civilians. Japan also considered biological attacks on the U.S. mainland by way of spreading plague, cholera, and other pathogens across California, although they narrowly avoided using this strategy due to fears that such an attack could spiral out of control. Unit 731 would also conduct horrific tests of their bioweapons against prisoners, as well as other medical procedures like unnecessary limb amputation, vivisection without anesthesia, and the administering of lethal toxins to measure their effects. Across the rest of the war, German scientists performed biowarfare experimentation on prisoners, although Adolf Hitler himself allegedly prohibited the development of such weapons because of his own experience with chemical agents in World War I. Britain ran experimentation with anthrax, including with bomb experiments on Scotland's Grenard Island, and in the United States, the War Reserve Service began a biological weapon development facility at Camp Dietrich, later Fort Dietrich in Maryland. During the Cold War, biological capabilities were developed by both the Americans and the Soviets, stockpiled with the intent that they be used offensively and researched in order to develop cures and countermeasures in the event of an attack. 
In the United States, biological warfare capability was expanded significantly during the Korean War, with new facilities opening up to produce biological agents and heavy investment into vaccines and therapeutic agents. By the 1960s, the United States had a wide range of pathogens, fungi, and toxins at their disposal, and ran human experimentation on volunteers at Fort Detrick. Multiple coastal cities were also used as covert sites of experimentation on how fast a range of pathogens could infect an area. The Soviet Union claimed to not have any biological weapons in its arsenal throughout the Cold War, but they too are known to have conducted extensive research into both offensive and defensive biowarfare measures. Britain tested and refined its own bioweapon stockpiles, and so did France, and in 1964 the Soviet Union even accused the nation of Colombia of using biological agents against peasants with the help of the United States. But all that changed, at least officially, in the late 1960s, when a wave of public and expert concern around the issue of bioweapons was enough to pressure most of the world's nations into proposing various arms control agreements and disarmament plans. By 1972, the world settled on a treaty that we're just going to refer to as the Biological Weapons Convention, or BWC, because we simply can't be bothered to call it by its full name, the Convention on the Prohibition of the Deployment, Production, and Stockpiling of Bacteriological, Biological, and Toxic Weapons, and on their destruction. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? The treaty banned its signatories from possessing or producing bioweapons in any amount greater than what would be needed to research cures and countermeasures, and called for all signatories to destroy any stockpiles, delivery systems, and production equipment that they had. As of today, 109 global nations are signatories of the treaty, while 76 others are party to it. But the BWC isn't necessarily the panacea that the world had hoped for back in 1972. It lacks any firm guidance on how to perform inspections of signatory nations, how to make sure those nations adhere to its protocols, and where the threshold is between defensive research and offensive productions of bioweapons. UN Security Council members can veto proposed inspections, and there are no established penalties for violators. In the 1970s, bioweapons were used in several known covert assassinations. In one case, a Bulgarian named Georgi Markov was killed in London when a poisonous pellet that was probably laced with rice and was shot into his leg via a modified umbrella. The same thing happens to another Bulgarian exile just days apart. In Laos, a still unexplained incident of so called yellow rain saw many people become ill after toxic clouds were allegedly spewed from planes and helicopters. In 1979, a Soviet microbiology facility lost control of its anthrax spores, causing an outbreak among humans and livestock in what Russian President Boris Yeltsin would later reveal was an accident related to an offensive biological weapons program. Iraq was revealed in 1991 to have participated in research on the offensive use of several biological weapons, and the Soviet Union kept up its research programs through the 1980s, if not until the Union's dissolution in 1991. Luckily for just about everybody on the planet, the deployment of bioweapons has not been common practice in large-scale modern wars, at least not in ways that we're aware of or able to perceive. But that has not stopped non-state actors from taking advantage of pathogens and toxins for their own purposes. In the 1980s, followers of an exiled Indian guru named Bhagwan Shri Rajneesh poisoned their local county in the US state of Oregon by contaminating the water supply with salmonella in order to suppress voter turnout and gain political control of their area. In the mid-1990s, the Red Army faction, also known as the Bader Meinhof Gang of West Germany, was found to be manufacturing large amounts of botulinum toxin in a safe house in France. Luckily, the stuff was never found to have been used, but if it had, then it could have killed quite a few people. Then in 1995, the Om Shinriku Terror Organization of Japan launched an attack on the Tokyo subway system using sarin gas, and while sarin is a chemical rather than a biological agent, the investigation into the group revealed that they had been nurturing a rudimentary bioweapons program using anthrax and botulinum for some time, and even had attempted at least three attacks. They'd also attempted to acquire samples of the Ebola virus in Zaire, now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, although they were not successful. In the days following the terror attacks of September 11, 2001, letters were mailed to U.S. senators and news organizations laced with anthrax and what will be known as the Amerithrax attacks. These letters would kill five and injure 17 more. Since 2003, reported bioterror attacks have led to zero deaths and just one injury, but attempts have been recorded in the US, Pakistan, Colombia, Russia, and most recently, Tunisia. Today, the prospect of large-scale biological attacks is not seen as a particularly large threat, either when compared to the use of other weapons of mass destruction or to the use of conventional weapons in military operations or terror attacks. 
But biological warfare still demands ongoing concern. As we've mentioned, most powerful nations around the world have at least defensive biological weapons research programs conforming to the expectations of the BWC, and it's widely understood that at least some such nations have what's called breakout capability. That is to say, that if the country decided they wanted to manufacture biological weapons, they'd have all the requisite skills and equipment to do just that within a short period of time. According to the United States, just one country, North Korea, still has an ongoing overt bioweapons program, while Iran, China, and Russia are engaged in various shady activities that suggest that they might not be conforming to the BWC. But the US, too, has been accused of maintaining a large biological warfare program that admits, most recently, Russia has alleged that the US and Ukraine are engaged in the development of biological weapons, although at present, those accusations are utterly unfounded. Today, the focus of defensive research around biological warfare has to do with predicting and getting ahead of the next major threat in an attempt to neutralize diseases that currently pose a major threat to humanity. Ironically enough, one of the most potentially devastating bioweapons is one that we've already dealt with, smallpox. While the virus is believed to be entirely eradicated from the globe, aside from stockpiles in the US and Russia, it's also a pathogen that nearly nobody in the modern world is prepared for. The last large-scale smallpox vaccinations in the US ended some five decades ago. Very few nations maintain smallpox vaccines in any quantities large enough to inoculate a meaningful proportion of their population, let alone on a moment's notice in response to an attack. Combine that with the high lethality of smallpox in most historical outbreaks, and while a smallpox attack is highly unlikely, it's close to the top of the list among the most potentially devastating bioweapons that could be produced. Also on that list is avian flu. Luckily for humans, avian flu crosses over and infects humans only rarely, but that's a trend that civilization really needs to keep consistent. With a mortality rate well above 50% in known cases, avian flu is one of those illnesses that you really don't want to get. But in recent decades, public health experts have sounded the alarm that bird flu might be a global crisis that's waiting to happen. Because of how rapidly viruses mutate and spread, it's entirely likely that at some point, a version of avian flu will come along that's more easily spread between humans, and modern practices of viral engineering and biological modification mean that in laboratory conditions, a nation state with the resources to invest in a weaponized version of bird flu could probably do just that. There are, of course, confounding factors at play. Bird flu's genome is highly unstable, and it's also the kind of virus where, if you're going to release it on the enemy, you've got to be ready to fully quarantine your own country as well as your allies. Otherwise, it's, you know, probably going to wipe you out too. But those drawbacks stop being drawbacks for isolated nations, pariah states, and some non-state actors, raising the likelihood that the nations that would choose to weaponize bird flu might be some of the most volatile out there. But all of this isn't to say that the older, more established, greatest hits of biowarfare are somehow less threatening than they've been in the past. In fact, pathogens like anthrax, tularemia, and the plague, as well as toxins like botulinum, are just as lethal as ever. Not only that, but recent advances in biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and more have led to elevated concerns that those pathogens might be easier to weaponize and modify than ever before. The Ebola virus, the Marburg virus, and the Bunya Riridae family of viruses pose their own significant threats, and every area of the world has other pathogens, parasites, and toxins that could be weaponized at scale. As climate change continues to cause previously frozen parts of the Earth to thaw out, there's additionally the potential for ancient viruses to be unleashed, for which humans have little understanding or available treatments. And while this is already a public health threat on its own, these pathogens could be a very potent weapon for whichever nation is able to discover and analyze them first. And finally, humans are still working out which pathogens pose a bioterrorism threat at all. According to one paper released in 2016 by parasitologist Mackenzie Quark, parasite worms called helminths could be the next major bioweapon, despite having barely been registered as a concern in the public consciousness. And finally, we've got to account for the potential threat that modern technology will make the production of bioweapons easier for non-state actors and potentially even lone wolf scientists or amateurs. Modern AI language models like ChatGPT have been spotlighted as a potential blind spot for biological arms control with the potential to educate people on how to create or acquire lethal pathogens, cultivate them with outstanding laboratory equipment, and avoid detection by skirting around pathogen sources that are watched closely by government entities. Genetic engineering techniques like CRISPR make it far easier for the average person to engage in gene editing, and with a thriving global community focused on biohacking, the technical expertise required to manufacture a lethal bioweapon could conceivably be just a few encrypted DMs away. Of course, 
We've got to emphasize that the process of creating a bioweapon in the modern day is only easy in a relative sense. Anyone who wants to create such a weapon must first be able to keep it from killing them. A difficult task under the circumstances, but exponentially worse when a person lacks access to advanced air filtration systems and state-of-the-art protective gear. Not to mention, that sort of thing is the stuff that will set up alarm bells if some random person comes along trying to buy them. They also need high-quality laboratory instruments with minimal improvisation and a base cost that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists plays is somewhere around $15,000. They'd need to get their hands on the virus or bacterium that they'd want to convert into a bioweapon, again, without getting themselves killed, and they'd need to be able to run some pretty serious lab experiments in order to make any progress. Finally, they'd almost certainly need to test their bioweapon before releasing it, if they want to have any level of confidence that it would succeed where other bioterrorism attacks have failed. It's a high bar to clear, but then again, it's still not quite so high that we can be entirely reassured. Unlike most of the world's destructive weapons, which exist completely outside the reach of the average citizen, some bioweapons are still remarkably accessible when compared to the danger they present to society. They are a tool that is, at least publicly, given up by most world governments, and they are a threat that basically the entire world agrees is simply too dangerous to play with. But when discussing modern-day biological warfare, all it takes is one rogue effort for everything we know to be turned upside down. A few amateur, or even professional biologists here, a cash infusion from a rogue state there, and all of a sudden, the world has a major biological warfare threat that it might not have even known about. Let's hope that that sort of reality will never come to pass.